No part of this job has been easy. Months ago, Ashley and I discovered something really scary. We found a massive amount of rot inside of the wall below our kitchen door. Oh my God, Ashley. The wall was legitimately on the verge of collapse. Our staircase was supported by a single bolt in a rotten beam. And since then, we have removed the rot, rebuilt the wall, sistered in new joists, and resided the facade. But the one thing that we didn't actually do is fix that leak. Winter is a really hard time to repair leaks. It's damp, it's cold, and all the sealants and adhesives you need to use stop working when things are wet and temperatures are below freezing. Although the main issue causing the leak is a lack of flashing around the door, because of the seasonal reasons I just mentioned. Like a weird sleet or something. I decided the best place to start was with an awning. This will provide a lot of rain production and it allowed me to begin the project indoors. In the previous video, I got the timber framing done and mounted, but as soon as I moved outside, this project became a challenge. Not because it's hard to make, but because it's two and a half stories up in the air, and I've been working from a 32-foot ladder. Behind the scenes, filming has also presented its fair amount of challenges, let alone the rain and snow. The landing is only four foot by four foot, meaning I can't fit me and a tripod on it. So this video was shot a little different than normal. I spent a fair amount of time setting up tripods on my neighbor's roof. Challenges aside, I am determined to persevere so we can get this awning done and stop that leak. In the previous video, I made the rafters at the same time as I made this fascia board, and uh, it was cut out using the rafters as templates to make sure that it fit nicely. Now at the time, I didn't have a ladder tall enough to reach the spot to install it, so I had to borrow one. Thanks to my buddy Stu for lending me the ladder. I'm sorry, Stu, I might have accidentally dropped it. <laughs> it. Turns out I'm used to moving 24 foot ladders, but a 32 foot ladder is a different story. So I asked my buddy Corbin to help me get it into position. So I also threw an extension ladder up on the stair side and this worked pretty darn well. I was able to lift sheets of plywood up on the stair side, which was a little bit easier going and actually lean the sheathing against the 32 foot ladder and nail most of it off from the stair side. I reached as much as I could from the ladder on the stairs and then went over to the other ladder to finish it off. With the sheathing done, it was time to install the drip edge. And the drip edge just allows you to redirect the water away from the roof and into the gutters. I like to install drip edge about a half inch away from the fascia board. So I actually slide it out a little bit. It's not pressed up tight against there. Now I had a lot of trouble getting this front corner nailed in. Uh, it's not because I'm bad at hammering, I don't think. It's because this front corner is a little bit bouncy since it's unsupported from underneath. I needed to shore it up and I, I figure out a way to do that later. With the stair side installed, I could go over the other side and install the second drip edge. On the peak of the roof, I added this product that's called Vicor. It's a self-sealing membrane. It's self-adhesive and it seals around any fasteners, any nails or screws that you put through it. When I was adding in that flashing, I realized that my ladder was starting to damage the drip edge that I just installed. So from the backside of the fascia, I screwed in a couple blocks so that the ladders have something to rest up against.
I was a little concerned about the ladder sliding off the side of the awning, so I screwed in a little block just to prevent that from happening while I'm working and not paying attention. I also hammered in this padded 2x6. This is going to help cut down on that bounciness so my nails drive in easier. Back in the shop, I cut some tar paper to length. I also found the middle of the tar paper and cut this little notch. This is actually going to let me fold the back edge of the tar paper up against the wall and add just a little bit of extra moisture protection between the wall and the awning. Outside, I could roll the tar paper over the top of the roof, align that center line, and try and set up my GoPro so that you can actually see what's going on. To attach the tar paper to the roof, I used a hammer tacker to staple it on. And I'm not sure what happened, but my middle measurement must have been a little bit off. I was, I was just shy by a couple inches. So I added in another strip of tar paper underneath to finish off this section. I left the tar paper about an inch long in the front, and that's because it's gonna sit underneath another section of drip edge. The drip edge gets cut at the same angle as the pitch of the roof, but only on one side in the center. So this is going to allow the second side to slip underneath it and give it a nice clean look. So the order of operations on roofs is very important. Basically, it's designed that every time you build one layer, there's a backup layer underneath so that water gets behind there, it can run out. Also on this side drip edge, I like to leave it long and then cut it away afterwards. I find that once it's installed, it's really easy to cut it to size. It's a little harder to measure it and find the angles when you're uh, down on the ground. As I mentioned before, the other side of the flashing gets cut square and then that gets slipped underneath that beveled edge that we cut before. These are basic asphalt shingles. They came from the home center. I tried to match the existing roof as best as possible. The old roof is a little sun faded and honestly, it's about as close as I could find. So this is what's called step flashing. It's typically used when you transition between two roof sections or a roof and a wall. I'm gonna say that I'm not doing it exactly by the book and I'll explain that in a minute. But first I wanna talk about how I'm starting this front edge. So I'm following the instructions that are on the package, depending on what shingles you use, the instructions may vary, but this one asks for a front edge with a half a course that you nail in four locations. And for every single strip that I lay on, I lay on a new piece of step flashing. I'm also in setting from the step flashing about a half an inch and I'm overhanging the drip edge on both sides. On the second side, I got smart and pre-cut all the shingles. The shingles are slightly longer than the roof, so I pre-cut them all down below. The first side, I was running up and down the ladder, and I didn't want to do that on the big 32-foot ladder. So I pre-cut all these and then just hung them over the top of the roof so I could grab them from the top and then nail them on from the bottom up. Now, a quick note about the step flashing. I mentioned before that I'm not quite doing this right. Ideally, you would have the siding of the building that goes over the top of the, the step flashing. That would get it completely waterproof. Obviously, there's a chance that I will have water that gets behind the step flashing. My only other alternative was to cut a, a groove in the current siding and slot a piece of Z flashing up underneath. I may still do that if uh, the water seems to be a problem getting behind there but I don't want to damage the siding in the process. So I'm, I'm gonna wait and see.
I've had a ton of folks ask me about these Orange Shield shoes I've been wearing and where they can get them. These are the Timberland Pro Radius Knit Composite Work Sneakers. I'll post a link down below to where you can find them. They come in a bunch of great colors, are extremely light and comfortable. Plus, they have a composite toe, so they protect your feet. After telling Timberland Pro how much I like their footwear, they decided to sponsor this video and sent me out another pair of sneakers to test. These are the brand new Cetra Composite Safety Shoe. Not only do these look great, they tick all the boxes as far as I'm concerned. I feel like as a garage woodworker, it's hard to find a good middle zone between safety and comfort. Boots that are built for construction are too bulky for me, and sneakers don't have the support and safety that I need. These shoes have a slip-resistant, non-marking EVA sole and a lightweight composite toe. So if you drop a sheet of plywood on your feet, you'll be safe. Timberland Pro's anti-fatigue technology provides all-day support and comfort, while their athletic-inspired styling comes in a bold variety of colorways. So if you wear them outside the shop, I promise you'll have people asking where you got your shoes from. Again, I'll leave a link down below to where you can find these shoes and loads more great gear from Timberland Pro. Thanks, Timberland Pro. Now back to the build. I think the hardest thing for me to figure out with this step flashing was on the peak of the roof. I watched several videos. I saw a bunch of different tutorials on how to do this. It's kind of a spot that's prone to leaks, but I couldn't figure out the perfect solution for how to overlap these without creating a gap underneath them. I cut out several different shapes and uh, experimented but ultimately I was left a little bit confused. I'm not sure I know what I'm doing. <laughs> the next morning I got up and I had a, a better understanding of what I had seen in those tutorials. And here's what I came up with. On one side of the roof, I did a straight cut, bent it over the front and then added a bit of silicon in the spot that's most likely to leak. I then overlapped that with a mirrored piece, pressed it into the wall, and nailed it off. I added more silicon and then added another piece that was cut at a 45 degree angle. I then bent up another piece that was at that 90 degree angle and nailed it on to the opposing side. With the flashing finished up, I can start in on the ridge shingles. And these are a different kind of shingle. They sell them in separate packs. They sort of break away into individual pieces. And you wanna nail them on away from the dominant direction of the wind. In this situation, it's obvious the wind is gonna to go towards the building. So I started from the inside and worked my way back. So in the last video, I got a lot of comments saying that I built this awning like a tank. And I will admit that I knew that I was climbing up on top of this thing, that at some point I'd have to stand on it. So no regrets on my end. So you'll notice that I am actually gluing down the last shingle. This is again to make sure that it doesn't accidentally lift up in the wind. And then the only choice that I have at this last bit on the roof is to face nail it. So I'm putting four nails into it and I'm gonna go back over the top of that with some sealant so nothing happens to leak. I have to say I was pretty relieved at this point to not be on top of that roof anymore. Now it's time to address the underside and deal with the gutters. I want the underside of the awning to have a nice finished look. So I picked up some of this soffit paneling. This is tongue and groove, so it's gonna to slot together. It's also Douglas fir, so it's gonna match the beams that I put in in the previous video. Also like the beams, I'm gonna apply a couple of coats of Halcyon Clear. This is a Total Boat product. I've got a whole video on how to use this stuff. I made sure to apply it to the end grain as well as the front and back, just so that I've got complete coverage, and then I can install it outside.
It was a bit of a tight fit for the first piece. Uh, it pressed up against the fascia, but that's kind of what I want. I don't want any gaps. The only gap that I do want is between the, the beams and the paneling. These are solid wood, so I want to allow for expansion and contraction. So put about a 16th on either side. I attached the panels with some trim head screws through the tongue. I found that I had to pre-drill those just to make sure that it didn't crack. I also put a couple of face screws into the top and bottom most panel just to make sure that they didn't lift up over time. In every project that I build, there's a moment where it starts to look like something, like it's coming together. And I feel like this is finally the moment where this awning starts to look like, a, you know, a real awning. As you can see, I'm leaving some gaps, and this is because there are four panels that will need to be cut to fit. So I got as many of them installed as I possibly could, and then I could take measurements so I could cut the rest of them in the shop. With those measurements, I set my table saw to 35 degrees. That's the same angle that I've been cutting all the angles at on this entire build and I trimmed off the excess. I think I just lucked out. Some of these were barely long enough, and I'm not sure what I would have done if I had to stitch in a small panel below. Before installing them, I also added some Total Boat Halcyon Clear to the exposed edges. The nice thing about the Halcyon Clear is that you can recoat within an hour. So I actually got four coats on this before installation. It's pretty awkward to get these things engaged because you need the tongue and groove to line up and it sort of sets in at an angle. I went through a whole bunch of my tool bags and I found this little pry bar and that managed to do the trick. In order to connect these panels, the only real option is to screw them in from the face. But again, I'm using these trim headed screws so they're not very noticeable. You may remember from the previous video that I had to remove a light fixture in order to install this and uh, I actually designed this awning around this light fixture because my mom got it for me as a housewarming gift when I first got this house. So it has a bit of sentimental value, so don't worry mom, I made a spot for it, it's still there, I cleaned it up, it looks great and it works great too. One of the big debates in the comments of the last video is how I was going to get rid of some of the water that comes off the awning. You'd be surprised how much water can come off of even a small rooftop like this, and dumping all that water onto the stairs is not the best idea. So I am gonna be adding a gutter. I'm not gonna add gutters on both sides. It's mostly over the staircase side that I'm concerned about. So I'm using these aluminum K style gutters. I had a surprising amount of trouble finding these. It seems like most of the big box stores have gone to vinyl now, but these are the ones that I'm used to and, and I like working with. I don't have all of the tools necessary. Uh, like I don't have a crimper for the end caps. It's like a $40 tool and I didn't really feel like spending that. I was able to get away with crimping with a pair of pliers. I think it's gonna be fine, but if you're gonna do a larger gutter, something that's actually like an important part of your house, I recommend buying a, a real pair of gutter crimpers. With the end cap sealed, I could move on to the downspout. And this actually presented a bit of a challenge because Typically, a downspout returns right up to the wall, but with the awning, it kind of goes perpendicular. So the wide end is in the wrong direction and it's too wide for the base of the gutter. So what I did was I kind of just crumpled the upper part of the downspout and I, I reduced the size of the drop. If this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it because it didn't work. <laughs> but I kind of got in the ballpark and I'll show you how I fixed it in a minute. 
But I want to show you how uh, I, I cut out for this drop. So I traced the outside of it where it was going to land when it's on the building. And then I went back and traced the inside of it because that's closer to what I actually want. This one, for some reason, has a tiny flange on them. You can find ones with bigger flanges, but I really couldn't find one locally. And so I had to be really careful with this, but uh, I just kind of snuck up on the cut. And as soon as it was fitting well, I could install it with some silicon. And after this is when everything went wrong. Okay, so <laughs> last night I shut off the cameras and then everything fell apart. I tried to secure the drop out of the gutter and um, the silicon started to separate and then uh, the little uh, clipped area right here also came apart. And then I, I was able to get it all back together and thought I was good and tried to attach the downspout, this elbow right here, and that started to crumple inward because I was trying to do it in the wrong orientation. So this crumpled and torqued and it wasn't square to the gutter anymore. It was obvious that it wasn't working, so I took the whole thing apart. This is the vinyl coupling that I decided not to use in the beginning because uh, the small end was on the wrong side. In other words, it was gonna leak if I put it together in the way that it's intended. But my buddy Dan on Instagram told me that you can actually uh, use a heat gun and, and crimp these in like they crimp in the elbows. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give that a shot. I'm gonna put a new uh, drop in and uh, hopefully, <laughs> Hopefully this will work and we can just attach it to the building. I mean, sure enough, Dan was right. This stuff is really easy to manipulate with a heat gun. I'm so glad I figured this out because it is a much cleaner solution to the problem. Fortunately, I was able to just widen the hole for the drop and uh, and fit in the new flange and it worked out perfect. I also added in three gutter hangers. These will align with the rafters in the roof and get screwed in from outside. I let that silicon dry overnight and then I could install it. That heat gun did such an awesome job. It was perfectly fitted to the drop. And then when I screwed it in, no torquing or twisting whatsoever. I put in a screw from each side. And now I'm sure everybody's wondering how this downspout is actually gonna go to underneath the building. I think this is just dumb luck, but the stair stringer was exactly two inches away from the outside of the building. And so all that meant was that if I cut a notch in the tread, I could actually slip one of these downspouts down between the stairs and the wall. I'm not sure what I would have done otherwise. Uh, it would have been a pretty elaborate piping job to get this thing to go anyplace else. But fortunately, I was able just to run the downspout straight down and connect it up. I was about to wrap up this video and call it there, but we got a beautiful sunny day here in Seattle and I just decided it was time to cut out this door and actually fix the leak. My buddy Luis came over for the day and he helped me pull the old door out and put the new door in. And here you can see what that sill was looking like. You can see there's no flashing on it whatsoever and the rot was so bad that I could just pull it up. And you see that brand new board underneath there, that's the rim joist that Josh and I hammered in from the outside of the building. And you can see all the way down into my shop below. After cleaning up the rot, I leveled out the floor and I trimmed a couple of these deck boards. I want to be able to wrap the sill underneath this deck and eventually I'm going to actually tear out all these deck boards, but in order to get enough access so that when I put the flashing in, I need to have a little gap here. 
To cover up this area, I'm using some construction adhesive and a panel that I cut down in the shop. Now I cut this to fit, I test fitted it beforehand and then glued it into place. Next up was to flash the sill, and for this I found some of these flexible sill corners, stapled them into place, and started prepping some of this Vicor. Vicor is a self-adhesive flashing membrane, and one thing that I recently discovered is that you don't have to remove all the paper at once. You can actually score it and tear it. This is a great trick. If you've ever worked with this stuff, it is so sticky, and it wants to stick to everything. So this allows you to take your time, just stick it to the spots that you want and then you can remove the paper later. I was able to use this technique to adhere the middle section first and then I could go to the two sides and make sure that those were nice and tight individually. Once I pressed the sides into place I could wrap and stretch it around the front. This connects to another bit of bicor that I wrapped underneath the siding in the previous video. I also left the paper on the front edge, which is gonna allow me to put the flashing up underneath that when I go to flash the deck after I replace the, all the deck boards. Before hanging the door, I unloaded an entire tube of silicon underneath this door. I do not want it to leak. And in the remote chance that water does get up underneath here, the water has a place to escape. So I'm only putting the silicon at the back and then a couple beads coming forward. Now it was time to install the door and I crawled up on the roof to set up the camera. It's like what Michael does for you guys, just to get the right shot. Despite Luis's kind words about getting the right shot, I kind of phoned it in on this one. I did put the camera on the roof, but uh, I figured I've done a video on how to install a door before. You guys can check that out. Uh, but the door did go in. It was relatively drama free. Uh, definitely shimming is always a bit of a hassle and it took us probably about half an hour to get it shimmed up and screwed in. And then the next day I came back and trimmed it out. Big thank you to Luis for helping me with this. I could not have gotten this done without him. We had the perfect day. It took us most of the day to get the door in and I am so happy that this leak is finally fixed and I don't have to worry about this door anymore. It's hard to express how much a relief this is to have this dry and not have to worry about it anymore. I've been worried about it for seven years. It was a massive project that's finally coming to the close. Obviously there's some more stuff to do, which is to button up this wall and fresh coat of paint on the outside and odds and ends, but for the most part it's done. The rest of it's probably gonna happen on Instagram. I love the look of the new awning. If you are interested in building an awning yourself, we've got plans up on my website, almfab.com plans. It's a step-by-step -step guide that takes you through every stage of the build, so hopefully it'll make it easy for you to build one yourself. Thank you to the sponsor of this week's video, Timberland Pro. If you are interested in picking up a pair of shoes like these, which I highly recommend, go check out the links in the description below. Also, as always, a massive thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best, and I'll catch you on the next one.